Hello, and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program's homeowner webinar series. Today, we have Lee Deal speaking about horticultural therapy. Uh, your microphones have been muted. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the comments section and, or the, I'm sorry, in the chat section, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Stick around until the end to take the survey. It helps me give you the kind of programming you like and it lets us know how we're doing. Uh, our next presentation will be May 18th at 11 a.m. and it will be on medicinal plants. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Her name is Lee Deal, RLA HTM, is the Director of Therapeutic Horticulture at Wilmot Botanical Gardens and lecturer in environmental horticulture at the University of Florida. She is a licensed landscape architect, a master gardener, and a registered horticultural therapist. She manages and teaches an undergraduate certificate program in horticultural therapy at UF and runs therapeutic horticultural programming for diverse populations. Lee began her work in horticultural therapy in Chicago in 1993, where she started up a therapeutic and pre-vocational uh, program for individuals with physical and developmental disabilities at Miss. Misericordia Home? Misericordia. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> the hard one. Uh, so Lee, you've got the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Welcome. Um, I'm happy to be here. And uh, my plan today is just to talk to you a little bit about horticultural therapy, give you a little bit of background, a little history. And then I'm going to tell you about two different programs that I've been involved in, one in Chicago. Um, and that my very first program, which was a true horticultural therapy program. And then the one that I run currently now at University of Florida, which is a therapeutic horticulture program. And I'll be telling you what the difference between those two program types are. So um, as we said, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat box and I will leave some time to be able to answer anything or just hear any kind of comments that you guys have. So um, I do wanna give you a little bit of background here see, let's make sure my, hmm, for some reason, my advance is not working. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I guess that's better. All right. Um, so according to Charles Lewis, who is an author that's written a lot about the people plant connection, the first recorded use of horticulture in a treatment context really actually took place in ancient Egypt when court physicians prescribed walking in the palace gardens for royalty who were experiencing mental illness. And the use of horticulture in treatment, at least as far as we know, didn't progress much past that until the late 1700s or the early 1800s where it began to evolve into a more accepted mode of treatment in the United States and in England and, and in Spain. Dr. Benjamin Rush, uh, who is widely considered the first American psychiatrist, used horticulture in the treatment of mental illness. He described in his writings the curative effect of field labor in a farm setting for people who were struggling with mental illness. So these findings of his were very well received by his colleagues in the United States and in Europe and really led to further testing of that theory. In the 20th century, we start to see horticulture being used to help people that um, have physical disabilities. In the United States, horticulture was being used in pro programming for soldiers with physical disabilities who were wounded in World, War, World Wars I and II. During World War I, what we're seeing is horticulture mostly be used, being used as a diversion for long-term patients and for occupational and recreational purposes. But during World War II, that really changed and horticulture was being used less as a diversion and more as an important component of therapy and rehabilitation. In 1959, Rusk Institute for Rehabilitative Medicine in New York at the New York University Medical Center, developed a horticultural therapy program within an attached greenhouse, and you're seeing a picture of it here. This was a major step forward for the horticultural therapy profession, because what was so great is that Rusk made the horticultural therapist part of the patient's treatment team, along with the doctors and nurses and other therapists, 
and they used horticulture, not just rehabilitatively, but also diagnostically and trying to figure out what is the best treatment for the particular patient. The first textbook was published in 1960 called Therapy Through Horticulture. And then in 1973, the National Council for Therapy and Rehabilitation Through Horticulture was founded. And then in 1988, the name of that organization was changed to simplify um, and increase name recognition. And that became AHTA or the American Horticultural Therapy Association. AHTA has been putting out the Journal of Therapeutic Horticulture regularly since 1986. And it's really considered the premier publication in the field of horticultural therapy internationally. They, it, they put it out twice a year now, um, and I had the honor of serving as editor-in-chief for about 15 years and got to really learn a lot of amazing things about horticultural therapy, therapeutic horticulture, research in the field, practice, um, not just in the United States, but really across the world. So the next thing I want to do is talk about the benefits of horticultural therapy and therapeutic horticulture. And we can really uh, categorize these benefits into these five basic areas, cognitive, social, emotional, physical, and physiological. And there is a lot of overlap um, in a, among all of these areas, but I'm going to try to focus this just what, how I describe this. So what cognitive benefits um, provide in a therapeutic horticulture or horticultural therapy program? Well, we can help to arouse curiosity because plants provide a source for exploration. Clients can increase their power of observation, a new awareness of the environment through seasonal qualities in the garden and through plants. Clients can increase their uh, knowledge through exposure to plants, their names of these plants and their care. They can attain new skills through planting and propagating and maintaining plants. Clients can increase their vocabulary because new activities and skills involve new learning and new learning of new terms. Clients can also learn or relearn new number concepts by counting things like seeds or cuttings or pots. And they can also increase their attention span um, and their focus because of the sensory stimulation that's involved in horticulture. Uh, working with plants can really increase motivation and um, it increases engagement with the particular activity. And clients can also stimulate their memory because certain plants and smells trigger memories. Now, of course, some of these things are going to be more appropriate for some client groups than others. You know, it would be very different if you were talking about a client group with dementia versus a client group with, you know, children with autism. But all of these things um, can help, you know, different client groups in different ways. So some social benefits. Clients can increase their communication skills by doing things like talking about the plants, providing information or instructions to other people about plant work. They can increase their, their interaction within a group by sharing ideas and sharing plants, sharing um, history and knowledge, working toward a common goal, and also increase interaction outside of the group because Plant work provides a lot of new topics of conversation with people outside of the program, whether it's your spouse or other family members or just uh, neighbors or other people. There are a lot of emotional benefits as well. Clients can increase their feelings of self-worth because taking care of plants is a worthy cause and it makes the world a better place. They can increase their confidence through short tasks with immediate and obvious results that emphasize success and the learning of new skills. They can also increase self-esteem because as you experience that success, then you're going to feel better about yourself and your abilities. We can also help to, improve, to promote interest and enthusiasm through excitement and anticipation about what's going to happen next. When you come back to the greenhouse or to the program next week, what's going to change in those plants that you've been taking care of, those seeds that you've planted? We can also help to promote and satisfy a client's creative drive by helping them to discover hidden talents or encourage exploration and provide opportunities for self-expression. Things like plant art, plant crafts are a really great way to do that. Clients can also relieve aggression or tension, which certainly affects their emotions because physical exertion can really alleviate those aggressive feelings and exposure to nature reduces stress. We know this, research has proven this. 
and it also allows for restorative experiences. Reality orientation, uh, the experiencing of relationships, of daily and seasonal changes and plant growth, these can really help to orient us. And especially for older adults with dementia or um, other cognitive issues along those lines. Some physical benefits um, of gardening and th that benefits we can see in horticultural therapy and therapeutic horticulture benefits. Of course, we can provide exercise. There's many opportunities for various levels of exercise in the garden or in the greenhouse. We can help to increase endurance. It's a lot easier to increase your endurance and work on that when the activity is one that you enjoy and it's an activity that occupies your mind in a positive way. We can combine with physical therapy and occupational therapy benefits or efforts um, that helps to provide to kind of make their uh, activities a little bit more meaningful as well. We can help to increase those ADL skills or those activity of daily living skills um, and independence and many skills that can be le learned in the horticultural therapy setting can be carried over to other areas of life and I'll talk a little bit about that later. We can also help clients to develop and increase their fine and gross motor skills, moving plants or other objects or uh, using a sprayer, manipulating seeds, soil, things like that. And we can certainly also help to increase eye-hand coordination um, while you're doing many of those things. And then finally, some of the physiological benefits. Certainly these are strongly related to the physical benefits, but we're talking about things like lowering blood pressure, lowering heart rate, lowering cortisol levels. These have all been proven through research that exposure to nature and interaction with um, natural spaces, gardens, and those kinds of things help to do this. And then all of those things help to relieve stress. And that of course is a, a healthy thing for us to do is to relieve our stress. So let's take a look at the difference between horticultural therapy and therapeutic horticulture. Um, I'm gonna read you two definitions and this is the, these definitions are put out by the American Horticultural Therapy Association. Horticultural therapy is the participation in horticultural activities facilitated by a registered horticultural therapist to achieve specific goals within an established treatment, rehabilitation, or vocational plan. Horticultural therapy is an active process which occurs in the context of an established treatment plan where the process itself is considered the therapeutic activity rather than the end product. So horticultural therapy programs can be found in a wide variety of healthcare, rehabilitative, and residential settings. And horticultural therapy programs track and document outcomes for the participants on an individual basis. Therapeutic horticulture is the participation in horticulture activities facilitated by a registered horticultural therapist or other professional with training in the use of horticulture as a therapeutic modality to support program goals. Therapeutic horticulture is a process through which participants enhance their well being through active or passive involvement in plant and plant related activities. And therapeutic horticulture programs are also found in a wide variety of healthcare, rehabilitative, and vocational and residential settings. So, in AHTA's definitions, which is what we also use at University of Florida, the program types, HT versus TH, are differentiated on the basis of individualized goals or group goals. Now, Haller and Capra, who are two professionals in the field and have put out some textbooks in horticultural therapy, define horticultural therapy as a professionally conducted client-centered treatment modality that utilizes horticulture activities to meet specific therapeutic or rehabilitative goals of its participants. And the focus is to maximize social, cognitive, physical, and or psychological functioning and to enhance general health and wellness. Dorn and Ralph, some other important people in this field, describe horticultural therapy as including three essential elements. It's a practice that uh, serves defined client goals, those with, I'm sorry, defined client groups, those with identified therapeutic or rehabilitative needs that is goal driven, so based on standard treatment procedures, and that uses the cultivation of plants as its primary treatment activities. And Dorn and Ralph 
itself really underscore the importance of the presence of all three of these elements to distinguish horticultural therapy from any other type of garden interaction. Now, in reality, there's probably a lot more therapeutic, I know that there's a lot more therapeutic horticulture programming taking place out there than there is horticultural therapy. Um, so in other words, a lot more programming where the goals are based on the group needs as a whole rather than based on an individual treatment plan. And that's not to say that in a therapeutic horticulture program, you can't tailor an activity to an individual's needs. You can, and you should when it's possible. Um, but you're not gonna be documenting individualized goals for the most part. Here's just a, to sort of say that again, um, the difference on the left, a horticultural therapy model, and on the right, a therapeutic horticulture model, they both have the client or the client group in the center as the main thing. And then the horticultural therapists and the plants are a very important component of that. But at the top, you can see in the horticultural therapy model, it's all about individualized goals. And in the therapeutic horticulture model, it's about group goals. And what I mean by that is that a group goal might be, you know, I'm working with a group of people with movement disorders. So I have goals for the entire group of mild exercise and working on eye-hand coordination and, um, you know, stimulating uh, finding gross motor skills and things like that. If this was a horticultural therapy program, then Mr. Smith would have a very particular goal he was working on and I'd be documenting that and tracking that. And Mrs. Brown would have another goal that might be similar, but also could be very different than Mr. Smith's goal. And I'm gonna be documenting that and tracking that as well. And those are both based on their individual needs. So that's really what I'm talking about. So groundbreaking research was published by Roger Ulrich in 1984. And this was really important um, in terms of the movement for us to understand the importance of nature in wealth, health and wellness. So he looked at hospital patients who had undergone gallbladder surgery to see if the view from their hospital room as they were recovering might have any kind of effect on their recovery. And he found that those patients that had views of trees from their hospital room had shorter hospital stays, they needed far fewer amounts of narcotic pain medication, and they received more positive written comments from staff and their medical records than did those patients whose views were of a brick building. So this was very important because it, it helped us to understand that even just seeing nature, just a view of nature could impact our health and our recovery. So this research and that of others like Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, who are also environmental psychologists, really started to give credibility to the idea that exposure to nature can improve health. And their studies also provided a foundation for many more studies on the people-plant connection that have continued and have moved into the horticultural therapy realm as well. We still have a lot to learn, a lot to tease out, but we, we are learning. There's lots and lots of research going on and more kind of building that um, that foundation uh, every year. So what I wanna do now is to introduce you to Misericordia Home and some of the residents that live there and participated in the horticultural therapy program that I started back in the 90s. I think this will be a good way for you to really understand what a horticultural therapy program actually looks like. So Misericordia Home is a residential facility um, north, north Chicago, like on the north edge of Chicago that is home to about 600, 650 um, individuals with developmental and physical disabilities that range from mild to severe and profound. This is a really amazing place. And I know it's hard to imagine that a facility with that many people living there could be a wonderful place, but having worked there and having a little brother that's lived there for many, many years, I can say that it is a phenomenal place and that every single resident is taken care of really well there. And I, it's a seven acre campus. Um, it's, as I said, it's right on the edge of Chicago. And you can see here in the picture, we're actually looking at some of the residences. So they have some houses there where kind of moderately functioning residents live. There's some apartment situations where some of the mild, um, the, the residents with mild disabilities live. And then there's some more, what you think of as a, as a unit um, 
where some of the more severe and profound residents live. So it's a really wonderful mixture of opportunities and also living arrangements. So I was fortunate to be able to start up the horticultural therapy program there. And not long after we did, we started out in a little classroom with grow lights and everything. And not long after we received a grant to build a greenhouse and that really opened up the program. So some residents come to the program for primarily an activity, a sensory experience, a place to kind of experience something new. It's calming, it's relaxing, it's soothing, and they participate in the activities but aren't paid for the work that they do. And then many residents come to the greenhouse program as a job. They, they get paid for what they do there. And so the, it is a somewhat production oriented greenhouse. When I first started there, our hope was that we could produce enough plants to sell to make the program um, kind of pay for itself. That's never really happened, but I think that the administration recognized how valuable this program was and they were willing to work it into their budget because they recognized the potential. Um, so that, that was great. So now most production activities can be educational and therapeutic, but it's really important to make sure that the people in the program have an opportunity to um, have opportunities for creativity and for some self-expression and for really kind of feeling like they're part of the program. So this particular program stresses education, such as learning about the plants, their names, techniques, you know, whatever level is appropriate for that particular resident. And that's one of the things that's really great about this particular program, any horticultural therapy program, is that we can help anybody no matter what their functioning level is. And that's one of the reasons they hired me is because they were having a hard time finding some meaningful work for some of the residents that had some severe disabilities, physical disabilities, especially some of those folks with uh, cerebral palsy. And, you know, they recognize the importance of providing meaningful work and, and meaningful opportunities for all of their residents, no matter their functioning level. And so in this program, we can have people of all functioning levels working and working together. And there aren't that many programs that are able to do that. So when the program or when the plant that we're working with has a strong sensory quality, and here you can see Walter is kind of smelling it on the right, um, that really helps people to understand and make a connection with that plant and, and to learn it better. They seem to be more drawn to the plant, um, whether it's because it's fuzzy or it smells good. So the sensory qualities are really important. And then these educational opportunities help residents to develop a knowledge base that's in turn helps them to develop a sense of ownership over their work, over their space, over the entire greenhouse. Um, and that really helps as well. And then also that helps them to be able to connect with the community when the community comes in to see the greenhouse or to buy a plant. Um, they can talk about their work or they can point out a plant or whatever that might be. But you know, maybe more important is the that feeling that these residents experience of self-worth, that their existence matters. They're learning about the plants, they're growing the plants, they're selling the plants, people are appreciating them, all that kind of stuff. Many of the residents at Misericordia have been protected and taken care of their entire lives, um, whether it's been at home and then they've moved to Misericordia later in their lives, or maybe they lived at Misericordia their entire life. And you know that's wonderful in many ways, but they've never had the opportunity to take care of something else, whether it's an animal or it's a sister or something like that. So in the horticultural therapy program, those roles are reversed for them. They're now in charge of something that's living and growing and is depending on them to survive. Now, not all of them necessarily get that intellectually, many of them do, but they all get that in the heart, in their hearts. And you can see it in their smiles and their bright eyes because they recognize that they're kind of in charge of something and that that thing really does need them. Some of the activities done in programs like this require things like pruners or rooting hormone, things that aren't necessarily appropriate for every resident to use. So rather than excluding those particular residents from those kinds of activities, what we do is form production lines so that everybody can feel part of that important finished job. So as an example, taking cuttings. One person can um, handle the clippers. Another person can strip those lower leaves off the bottom of the cutting. Another dunks the stem in water and passes it onto the next person that dunks it in the rooting hormone. Meanwhile, somebody else is mixing up the soil and filling the pots, making a little dibble in the soil to put the cutting in. Somebody else is placing the cutting in the soil and then somebody else is in that um, cutting. 
So this group of tasks represents something that anybody of any, there's something in there that somebody can do no matter what their functioning level is. And by creating this production line to complete the job, we are minimizing feelings of inability and we're maximizing feelings of ability and cooperation and teamwork and completion and ultimately success. There are a lot of maintenance activities in a greenhouse that need to be completed and the residents are responsible for those as well. I'm a strong believer in the fact that everybody that's in a program like this should be part of cleaning up. They should be part of setting up because that helps to build not just responsibility, but that sense of ownership that I think is so important to building self-esteem. So, you know, washing pots, sweeping up. And then at Ms. Recordia, all of the residents work on formal goals and objectives to improve their skills and to provide reasonable challenges and work toward greater independence at whatever level they're capable. A good number of the residents in the horticultural therapy program work on at least one of those goals in the greenhouse. So a greenhouse job is given to a resident that relates to a skill area that they're working on. It could be something like increasing attention span or staying on task following directions, um, maybe controlling anger or developing appropriate social skills, or it could be something more vocational in nature, you know, learning uh, horticulture techniques. So what I want to do next is show you some examples of these kinds of goals and interventions that can take place in a horticultural therapy program. So this is Mark and Mark has cerebral palsy. And when he came into the program, he was um, working on increasing strength and dexterity. So we decided, and this was before we had the greenhouse, we were working in a classroom building with grow lights. And as you can imagine, it was very dry and the plants didn't like it very much. So creating some humidity was important. And because Mark was working on strength and dexterity, we decided we would try to see if we could get him to be able to use a spray bottle. Well, at first um, that was impossible. He could not even wrap his fingers around that spray bottle. But we knew that this was an important thing for him to work on that, um, find those finding gross motor skills. So at the beginning, we worked with him hand over hand. We literally put our hand over his hand and helped him squeeze that, that trigger. And over time, over a lot of time, he increased his ability to be able to do that, his strength, his ability to be able to do that independently. And this was a major accomplishment for Mark because he could now do a very important job that the plants really needed um, independently. With that came feelings of self-worth, self-confidence, increased self-esteem. And another really wonderful benefit was that this new skill carried over to other parts of his life. He was better able to pick up a fork, um, grasp a pencil, have better control over the joystick of his electric wheelchair. So this very simple activity le led to increased independence in many different areas of those ADLs, those activities of daily living. Virginia here on the left came to live at Misericordia in her late 50s after living at home her whole life. And she was very shy. This really isolated her um, from, you know, kind of socially, and it made it really hard for her to adapt to this new life at Misericordia. So the treatment team decided that it might be good for her to try out the horticultural therapy program. She'd done a lot of gardening at home with her mother, so it was familiar to her and she liked plants. And so we found that it, she relaxed there and um, we could come up with some topics of conversation that felt a little bit more neutral for her. She felt a little more confident about plants. And so through some goals and directed goals, we were able to get her asking questions and answering when somebody asked her a question, starting with kind of plant related work. Um, as she became more comfortable with that garden related conversation, then she found it a little easier to talk about herself and open up a little bit. And that really helped her to develop friendships. And you know, this didn't happen in a week. It didn't even happen in a month. It was longer than that, but we sort of cracked open that door a little bit. And then that made it much easier for these things to take place. And again, all through these goals, progressive goals that we would create for her. Now, Mary Jean here, um, on the other hand, had the opposite problem. She talked and talked and talked, never stopped talking, and um, nobody else could ever say anything because she was always talking. She didn't really care to listen to anybody else. And this was also a problem for her because nobody even wanted to sit near Mary Jean because there was no point. You couldn't have a conversation with her because she would just talk. 
And she would talk about her mother all the time, which wasn't really all that interesting to other people, especially after you'd heard about her mother for many hours. <laughs> so we were recognizing that this was also getting in her way of making friendships. Um, and, you know, of course she didn't recognize this. And so um, we wanted to figure out a way for her to kind of cut back on all that over talking and all that talking about her mother and find some other ways for her to open, be open to conversation. So with staff help and the use of very directed goals, Mary Jean began to use the garden and the plant work she was doing as a topic of conversation. And this of course had more interest for other people. She talked about her own work at first, but eventually she learned through these goals to listen to what other people were doing. And that helped her to avoid always focusing on herself. And she actually learned that she kind of was interested in what other people were doing too, if she would just stop long enough to pay attention. Now, as I said, it's really important to recognize that these changes do not happen overnight. They're not always easy. And sometimes we have to back up and try a different route because it's not working, but they are the result of carefully constructed goals that are facilitated and charted by trained staff. Gaining skills or changing behaviors can take a long time. They're the result not of a single goal, but of a series of goals that build on each other. Here's Mary Jean again, working on some, looks like some, maybe some dead plants. Um, and then here's Judy and Judy has cerebral palsy uh, as well. And one of the things that's so frustrating about cerebral palsy is that oftentimes the individual's brain is functioning very well. They're, they're intellectually sprite. Um, they're not, many of them are nonverbal, so they can't even uh, you know, express their, their bright thoughts. And so it really is very frustrating and their bodies just don't let them do what they feel like they wanna be able to do. Um, and so finding challenging work for an individual like Judy can be really hard because you, we need to stimulate her brain, not just her body because her brain functions at a much higher level than her body does. Um, and that kind of brings me to an important point I wanna say is that what I believe very strongly about working with somebody with a disability or anybody that you might find um, in a horticultural therapy program is that it's so important that we provide that person with as much independence as possible. And sometimes we need to get pretty creative in order to do that. One example that we came up with, um, oops, there, here we go, is, with John. John um, has Down syndrome and he was very capable of doing activities, but he, and he loved to water plants, but he had a very difficult time assessing whether or not a plant needed to be watered. We tried to teach him this skill, but it just didn't work. Um, he just couldn't grasp that. And I don't blame him because I have college students that can't quite grasp that. So it's not that, that big of a surprise. So we devised a plan where in the morning, a staff member would place flags in all the pots that needed to be watered. So you can see the red and blue flags here. So those are all sticking in a pot that's dry. One flag equaled one cup of water. So if it had three flags in it, it needed three cups of water. And when John arrived to work, he knew that his job was to get his um, tray or his cart and a bucket of water and his cup. And then he would start going from pot to pot. And maybe he was assigned the blue flags that day and he would start watering all of those pots that had blue flags in them. As, and then that took, the flags took the guesswork out of it. So he could just get his work done. And then because we had many different flags and uh, residents love to water, we could have several different residents doing this activity at once. Um, so that was really great. Now, John also struggled with letting staff know when he was finished with his work. And this was another thing that we were working on with him. So when he was done with all his flags, he would just stand there by that last pot and just wait for somebody to come up to him. And so if we had had a especially busy day or we were, you know, something going on with the resident, we may not notice that he's just standing there waiting for us. So we were working with him on approaching us when he was, when he recognized that he was finished. Um, so that was another job. We were doing that, but he, he, we eventually helped him learn that once there were no flags to pull, he would then come to us with this big pile of flags and let us know that he was finished. And another benefit that we didn't really anticipate was that he was, when he was finished, he actually had this big pile of flags that you can see there on his cart that was very tangible evidence of all the work that he'd done. So you don't really think of watering as tangible evidence so much because the water goes in the pot and it's gone. 
But with this flag system, you know, he could even count those flags if he wanted and tell us how many pots that he watered. So that really made him feel great and very important and necessary. So in addition to providing as much independence, which is that what that system did for John, it provided him independence. It's also really important to help he or she really understand and feel the importance of their work, whatever that might be, so that they really know it's meaningful work, not just an activity to pass the time. And that's the beauty of horticulture. It is meaningful work. We value plants. Society values plants. It is meaningful. So that is one of the really wonderful things that makes that different and it makes it work. So back to Judy, um, as, I, as I said, she's very physically limited in her movement. She needs hand over hand assistance to do almost everything. Um, she had a little bit of lateral movement with her arm. And so in thinking about some independence and what we could do for her, she always asked me, could I please fill pots? I just wanna fill pots. And I remember first thinking, how am I ever gonna make that happen? Because she can't lift her arm up and down. So, you know, we thought about it, thought about it, and then finally came up with this idea of getting a new tray for her wheelchair. You can see that plexiglass tray there. We cut a big hole in one side of the tray. We put a traffic cone upside down in that hole and then put a pot down on the floor underneath that traffic cone. Then we could dump a bunch of soil on the tray, put a little water in there, and then she had just enough lateral movement with her forearm that she could kind of mix it and push it, edge it over and edge it over into that traffic cone. So it would fall down the cone and into the pot. And she did that, she could do that independently as long as we set it up for her. So that was fantastic. That was her dream. And we were able to help her in a pretty simple way once we put our creative thinking caps on to be able to um, achieve that goal. And that was really exciting. The last person I want to tell you about is Mark, um, and Mark is a fairly high functioning man with Down syndrome and Mark came to the greenhouse um, with some pretty significant behavioral issues. His treatment team thought that it would be worth seeing if working in the greenhouse would be a more calming envir environment for him and one that he did better in. Well, we very quickly realized that one of the things that set Mark off into these behavioral episodes was when somebody told him what to do. He hated being told what to do. Somehow it made him feel like he had no control and really disliked that. And then when he had a behavioral episode, he'd get mad and he'd slam things and he'd yell and he'd storm out. And then it was very difficult for him to recover. And to so it would kind of ruin the rest of his day. Um, now, Mark was high functioning other than that. And so he could get paid for the work that he did. And we actually really relied on him to get a lot of work done. And so we needed to figure out a solution to this issue because we needed to be able to tell him what we needed him to do in the greenhouse that day. So we came up with um, a pretty creative, but again, very simple solution to this. We created a mailbox for Mark. And we put it in the storage room of the greenhouse. And this was kind of special because the residents at Misericordia don't have mailboxes. I mean, their mail just gets delivered to them and they're in the living room or their, their bedroom or something like that. So this was kind of a really cool thing for Mark to have. And um, we would then write up a job list for him in the morning before he showed up to work. And so Mark knew, and actually that was an early goal. We worked on him within five minutes of arriving to the greenhouse, he needed to go and retrieve that job list. So, um, and he, he was excited about checking because it was kind of like getting mail for him. And so a job list might look like, you know, something like this. Um, there are always two jobs on it. And then usually after that, once he got those two jobs done, he could choose a job of his liking. Now, what's so interesting is that Mark couldn't read. So he was not able to read what was on this job list. He would have to take the job list to a staff member or a volunteer and ask them to read it for him. But that was okay with him. He didn't, that didn't upset him. He didn't feel like they were then telling him what to do. And I, I think there was maybe some component of him choosing who to take it to or him choosing how long, I mean, he still needed to do it in a fairly short amount of time, but, you know, kind of, he was still making some choices in that process. And so um, I think that that made a big difference for him. And anyway, his Behavioral incidences decreased significantly. They certainly did not disappear altogether, but they decreased to a point where they were pretty easy to manage and they no longer got in the way of his day. Usually when it did happen, we could pull him back and 
you know, have a conversation and sort of get reset. And, you know, the other thing that was interesting is Mark really didn't like plants. He didn't really want anything to do with the plants. He wanted to be the maintenance guy in the greenhouse. So he loved to take out the trash. He loved to clean pots. He liked to sweep some things like that, which was great for me because I really needed that help. Um, and the amazing thing was within a month after we set up this mailbox system for him, we were starting to get reports from other parts of campus that his behavior was settling down in those areas as well. And that, of course, was such a wonderful thing because it was making his life so much better, his quality of life better. And here's Mark relaxing after a hard day of uh, work. And I put this picture in here because I do think it's so important that we remember to give the people that we're working with an opportunity, especially in some pre-vocational and vocational programs, the opportunity to really relax and sit back and enjoy all the work that they've done and enjoy those plants that they've planted or they've created or grown or propagated or whatever it might be to be able to kind of take that in. So the program at Misericordia Gardens is really twofold. And I, I think that um, these should be goals for any program, people with disabilities. And first it provides a therapeutic environment for uh, where a person can really experience the positive qualities of nature through working with plants and their sensory qualities. And second, it really provides dignified, uh, challenging and meaningful work to the residents that are there, giving each person the, in, the opportunity to be in, as independent as possible. And independence does not mean working alone. That's not at all what I mean by that, but rather letting a person take responsibility over his or her work, um, ownership over his work. And by doing that, feel more fully that he or she has contributed something meaningful, something um, important that, that their, their existence is meaningful, that it matters. And that concept that we're contributing, that we're necessary, that's important to all of us, whether we have a disability or an issue that we're struggling with or not, because that really does speak to our self-esteem and our self-worth, and that's important. So what I wanna do next is um, share with you a little bit about the program at, at the University of Florida. And I'm gonna do this kind of quickly so I can leave a little bit of room for questions. I'm gonna see if I can get this. Well, it's not looking, I have a short little video here. Give it a second to see, yep, it might go. I drove by this area every day to and from home and I was just curious what is it because it was sort of like a jungle and when I became Dean of the College of Medicine in 2002 I became even more interested because I realized that this was the only remaining green space on the Health Science Center campus. Talking to some people I thought we should restore it. We decided that the gardens should not just be a place to come sit and enjoy the outer doors, but in fact reflect the activities of the buildings that were all around us. So that was research, education, and patient care. We were noticing that a lot of people were coming to the gardens to get away from the stressors that are happening around these gardens. And so we thought it was time to make that experience more purposeful, more intentional. That's when we started the therapeutic horticulture program. I have a little brother who had a traumatic brain injury when he was little. And so growing up with that experience, I think I always recognize the importance um, and the value in people with special circumstances. We are giving people the opportunity to build up their self-esteem and their sense of self-confidence and self-worth. So many of the folks that we've been working with, because of their disability or their disease or their whatever issue they're struggling with, they've felt that they haven't been contributing to society and that makes them feel bad about themselves. So I feel like it's my job to help them understand the value of what they're doing here in the greenhouse and that their work really has meaning. And we also try to provide a community here so people can really feel like they're part of this space, part of this place, Wilmot Gardens, this greenhouse. And I think building or rebuilding a sense of community for some of our participants is also very important. I think that a lot of times when people are struggling with mental illness or they're struggling with a physical disability or any other life trauma or event that connecting with a stranger that may not be the same age as them or may not have the same experience as them or may not have anything in common with them is a sort of experience that 
is really valuable. And the horticulture therapy program in particular is so unique because it connects students from the university with people in the community to build connections over something of a third party like plants. And so it's really a unique opportunity to be able to have that experience. Hopefully one day I can become a healthcare professional that incorporates nature and plants into the healthcare setting and practice. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that so you had a kind of a sense of what our space looks like and some of the different kinds of things we do. The therapeutic horticulture program at UF is not um, financially supported by the university right now. They, of course, I'm a faculty, so they support me, but all of the programs that we run, we have to fundraise for. And so while that's hard, um, the upside of that is that means that we get to work with a lot of different groups of people. Uh, we apply for a lot of grants, we solicit donations, we have two big plant sales every year that help to support some of our programs in, in the gardens as well. And I hope that's not always going to be the case, but um, that's the way it is right now. So we do work with a lot. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so I've, the, one of the first grants we, were, we got was from Dialysis Center Incorporated, and this was a two-year research grant working with people um, with end-stage kidney disease. About the same time, we received funding from the Paralyzed Veterans of America, um, and this was a one-year grant working with veterans with spinal cord injury and disease. We also received funding from the Climb, whoops, sorry, the Climb for Cancer Foundation, um, we go to work with people affected by cancer. And we also received some funding for the from the Dana and Christopher Reeve Foundation to work with people with stroke associated paralysis. So these are all different types of client groups, of course, with all different kinds of needs. So as an example, with our stroke associated paralysis group, we're really working on horticulture activities that um, help with eye hand coordination, gross and fine motor skills, things like that. With our cancer group, we're really thinking more about social support and opportunities for creative expression and um, ways to be able to support each other. So it really varies. We could be using the very same horticulture activity, but we're gonna emphasize different parts of that activity to support that particular group in a different way. So we do do a lot of different kinds of activities, certainly lots of propagation activities, um, and things like that. But we also do a lot of plant crafts, plant art, edible kind of things. We received funding from the UF Center for Movement Disorders to work with some of their patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, this was a really great group. And we also uh, have a group of veterans with mental health issues. We currently have another group of veterans, just women veterans that come. And one of the things that's really unique about this program is that we work with the caregivers as well in most of our groups. So we invite the caregiver to be a part of that experience as well, or I should say care partner. Um, we have worked with the Department of Psychiatry at UF to work with patients with severe depression um, in their ECT unit, their electric convulsive therapy unit. And we're, we did collect some data on that. It was not, um, it was a very tough data collection situation. So we're still kind of work, working through some of that data have not yet published anything on it. We did publish a paper on the kidney disease group and um, just coming out with another one soon on one of our wellness groups. Um, but one of the things I wanna say about that, the depression group is that really led us to try to figure out, gosh, what is the optimum, optimum dose? How many times does somebody need to come to, to experience benefits? And then how long do they last afterwards? So lots of interesting questions like that. We work with the FRC, the Florida Recovery Center, working with young adults in addiction recovery. So in this group, we're trying to provide stress relief, teaching good healthy habits, you know, positive leisure skills, things like that. We've also had a program for young adults um, with autism, teaching job skills and pre-job skills as well. Many of them have gone on to do tutoring with us for the FNGLA. And actually seven of them have passed the FNGLA certification exam, which we're so proud of. 
Um, we've also had a group of uh, young adults with developmental disabilities that we worked with as well. Um, really wonderful groups. And I just wanted to show you this quickly. I'm uh, just about running out of time here, but this is an activity that um, we, uh, that, uh, like an activity sheet that I would put together. So, and I know you can't necessarily read all of this, but so this would be a plant pressing activity. And at the top here would be the overview of the activity in the box here are the particular materials that would be used in that particular activity. At the bottom are the general directions for the activity. And then this area in here would be the primary goals or the benefits that I want to emphasize in that session. So this is something I'm gonna be sharing with my volunteers, with my um, you know, people that are helping me run the session. So I might choose three particular areas for that particular group. In this case, sensory stimulation, motor skills, and social interaction. So I'm going to be talking about how can this activity help us to emphasize those things. So in a plant pressing activity, by picking those leaves and flowers, we can, we can stress sensory stimulation through smelling them, touching them, noticing the sounds and the smells, the views in the garden. The motor skills we can emphasize through how we're collecting those, how we're cutting them, how we're arranging them in the press, things like that. And then social interaction. You know, how are we doing that? We're gonna to talk to each other about what we're gonna do with these when they're dry. You know, sharing them with each other. Oh my gosh, I didn't see that beautiful red flower out there. Well, I'll share it with you. You know, some of those kinds of things. So these benefits may change from group to group, although the activity itself may not. And this is the stuff that's gonna elevate it from a horticulture activity to a therapeutic horticulture activity. I mentioned we do some tastings. We try to work with a lot of sensory plants. Um, these are just some of the uh, activities we've done with pressing leaves and flowers. Um, you can see these beautiful artworks that some of our participants have done. The um, one in the upper left is actually done by a young man in our addictions recovery group. I just think it's beautiful. Bookmarks, cards some decoupage onto jars and votives. We do a lot of repurposing, reuse a lot of stuff. I shop a lot at Goodwill <laughs> to find a lot of things. We do a lot of work with herbs, make herb bowls, um, send them home. We can talk about recipes. We grow lots of basil in the spring to do just that. Um, these are lettuce bowls. So we've grown all these things from seed and we've transplanted them and thinned them. And now we're transplanting them in bowls for the participants to take home with them and um, either transplant into the garden or put on the windowsill to use for salads and sandwiches. So we can talk about nutrition as well. Dr. Dave Clark at UF has been really wonderful in donating a lot of beautiful coleus to us over the years. Such a wonderful plant to work with because of its sensory qualities. It's so easy to propagate. It has the amazing square stem because it's in the mint family. And so people are always shocked by the fact that a plant can have a square stem. And so that's another fun, kind of sensory component. Um, this is a plant pounding activity that we've done. This is a group of veterans that we've worked with. Um, this is a great sensory activity, but also a good way to relieve some tension as well. And some beautiful art that people have made from these activities. This is another one, a plant pounding that then a participant's taken an ink marker and turned it into something really beautiful. So uh, we also have just started a group for um, UF students. You know, I don't, many of you may be aware that university students across the country are really struggling with depression and loneliness and anxiety and stress. And this was before COVID. And so of course it's only amplified during COVID. And so we've started a group to try to battle some of those things. We're partnering with the Counseling and Wellness Center at UF. Um, that's our most recent group. And, so I've given you some different examples of how we use horticulture interventions with different kinds of client groups, but I really wanna reiterate that an essential aspect of all therapeutic horticulture and horticultural therapy programs is that we're providing a holistic intervention. The goal is not always to fix people or cure people or to restore them to their original state of health, but instead to help them find wholeness again. So in doing that, we need to make sure we ensure their um, safety, their comfort and both physically and emotionally. That it often invo involves helping them find compensatory strategies to increase their independence, their confidence, and just get, help them give, help give them greater well-being. So to do that, we really need to help um, by meeting each client where they are. And we've become pretty good at creating an environment where people feel accepted, where they feel respected. 
and therefore less isolated and more empowered. So in that video, I talked about the importance to me of creating community through our program. And I've really seen the benefits of that man manifest in a lot of different ways. With that goes that sense of ownership because when a person feels a sense of ownership over their environment, their community, their work, then they feel empowered. And that really helps to build that self-esteem, self-efficacy and self-worth. And I also really make sure that the participants have choices, choices of activities and then choices within activities. If they're feeling um, actively involved in organizing and making decisions, then they're gonna be more engaged and they're gonna feel more ownership. There's so many opportunities in a garden and through working with plants to regulate the nervous system, to calm the body and the mind. And through nature and the garden, participants can actually customize their regulatory techniques, whether it's weeding, it's harvesting tomatoes or using the garden to just engage your senses or doing mindfulness, any of those things we can do. And plants don't judge. And if we can also practice and project non-judgmental acceptance, then our clients can benefit from that, that safe and emotionally comfortable space that we've created. We need to remember that nature doesn't tell us what to do. It just is, and it lets us just be. And in that way, it really is an important component of therapeutic horticulture programs, of horticultural therapy programs, and of our journey to health and wellness. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lee. Um, we have a few questions. Uh, let's see. Most of them are um, in relationship to uh, the profession. Um, is the horticulture, UF, the UF program available online? Yes, so our certificate program in horticultural therapy is available to both UF students and what we call non-degree students. So I've got somebody in China, Taiwan, South Africa right now in the program. Um, so yes, and it is fully online, the first three courses, and then the fourth course is a choice between an independent study or an internship. Neither of those have to be done at UF, but depending on whether your plan is to become professionally registered as a horticultural therapist or not, there are some requirements for that. But yes, you can participate in it fully online. Okay. Uh, what are the educational requirements to become a horticultural therapist? So you need nine credit hours in horticultural therapy, which our program provides. You need 12 credit hours in horticulture sciences and 12 credit hours in uh, like health social sciences. And they have a... Um, sort of a, a, you know, certain courses that they'd like you to have, some general type courses. And then you also need a bachelor's degree, but it doesn't need to be in horticultural therapy. But the other thing you need is a 480 hour internship. And that needs to be under the supervision of an already professionally registered horticultural therapist. So of course at UF, we can offer that because I am professionally registered. There are other people. There is an opportunity for offsite supervision, which means you might be doing your internship somewhere else. You know, let's say I'm your offsite supervisor, but you're in North Carolina, I'm supervising you. Again, there's some requirements for that. They're trying to make it, you know, recognizing that there aren't tons and tons of registered horticultural therapists. But all of those, those are the requirements. And then you submit your application. Now they are moving toward, um, they're hoping to have a licensing, licensing exam. And my guess is that that'll be out in the next three to five years. I think some of that stuff will still be required, but right now it's, a, it's an application process once you have those things accomplished. Okay, are there um, prerequisites for the certificate program? Like, do you need a, a degree in something else or is it standalone? We do ask that you have completed at least one year of college. Um, although I also, it's um, you know up to me <laughs> as, the, as the instructor. So although that's, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. Most people have at least started or have at least a year mm -hmm. of college, but yet you do not have to have a degree to participate in, in it. And you don't have to even have any horticulture courses. We tell you what you need to know, but then you know the expectation is that if you wanna go on in this field, you're gonna take some horticulture courses anyway. Okay, um, how long is the program? Like how many so it's, semesters? It's four courses. Um, and right now we offer one course per semester of the lecture courses. Uh, 
but some students will take, if they go the independent study route or even the internship route, they might take that simultaneously with one of the lecture courses. So it could be a year and a half, but most people are doing it in two years. Okay. Um, I have a, a bunch of great, great uh, presentations and thank yous. Um, uh, I have one question. Will UF consider discounting their certification to master gardener volunteers? Um, I don't know if you can answer that or not. Uh, and my guess is probably not because we are not, because it's um, offered, I, probably not to be a straight answer. Yeah. Um, if you're a Florida resident, there's a discount, but not, you know, you, you, and it's actually less expensive, I believe, than a, a typical class. But we don't have any way to offer financial aid to, right. to non degree students. So, unfortunately, at this point, not. Can horticulture? Oh, horticultural experience substitute for the educational requirements? Um, for the academic credit, if that's what they're asking, that's a good question. And um, I, it's possible. AHT actually has a fantastic um, amount of information on this. And if you just go to AHTA.org, I can put that in the chat. Okay. They have this whole set, like it says, how to become a horticultural therapist. They have this whole section on the rules and regulations for the internship and for the requirements. And I know there is some kind of life experience thing in there. I can't remember if it is for some of the horticulture courses, which it might be. Like if you've been working in the nursery industry, that might cover some of that, but I don't know what the exact details of that are, but I know there's something okay. in there. Okay. Um, what is the best way to get involved in volunteering uh, with a program. Um, with a program or any program? With, uh, with any program, um, yeah. Uh, I would, yeah, I'd say if, you, if there's a program nearby you, I would contact the manager of that program and just let them know you're really interested. Usually, I know we're always love to have volunteers, especially volunteers that are interested in this. In our program, we do require that the volunteers go through a special training. So that may be the case somewhere else. But especially as master gardeners or people that already have horticulture experience or horticulture interest, that's just going to be a plus. So I would just reach out directly to the person that's running the program and let them know you're interested. And I'm sure they'll have they'll be very happy. Great. Uh, that looks like it's all the questions that we have, and um, we're just a little bit over time. But um, thank you, Lee, for joining us today, and. Um, it was a great presentation, very informative, and it looks like from the comments that all of our uh, listeners loved it too. So good, thank you so much. I really appreciated the opportunity, and you know, please come visit us at Wilmot. It's a beautiful garden. We'd love to have you come by sometime. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lee. Have a great day, everybody.